Hello everyone. Good morning. My name is Tara Menon. I'm from CMN and I aspire to create awareness and increase exposure to the Canadian community about all different kinds of art forms. Today we have with us Ms. Lata Pada, founder and artistic director of Sampradaya Dance Academy, which is not only a prestigious institute known for specializing in Bharatanatyam and other contemporary art forms, but also the only institute in North America integrated with the UK-based Imperial Society for Teachers for Dancing. Welcome, Ms. Lada. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. How have you been? Thank you. Very well. Thank you, Uttara. <laughs> Um, we're living in some crazy times right now with the pandemic causing issues for everyone left and right. So how have you and Sampradaya Dance Creations been adjusting with the recent changes? Well, it's certainly like all other artists and arts organizations, it's been a very challenging time. Um, and uh, we've had to adapt to technology very quickly. Mm -hmm. to, to be able to continue with our artistic activities mm -hmm. on the, uh, we are two organizations, two separate organizations, which is Sampradaya Dance Creations, which is the professional dance company, mm -hmm. uh, which produces productions, mm -hmm. which tours across Canada and internationally. And mm -hmm. then we have Sampradaya Dance Academy, which is the professional training in, uh, institute for dance. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, uh, the uh, training institute that has a very uh, rigorous training uh, curriculum to pr uh, create dancers for, um, you know, to become professional dancers if they choose to. So it is a very rigorous, uh, curriculum of uh, over 14 years to become a dancer with the Academy. Both of these organizations have had to uh, adapt very quickly to online tools for, uh, right. for training. And so in the Academy, all the teachers had to um, learn very quickly how one adjusts to students dancing within their own homes, Mm -hmm. and uh, and all the challenges about teaching um, individual students in very uh, I, uh, you know limited spaces within their homes mm -hmm. um, and uh, and you know there is a time lag when you're teaching in zoom and right. as you know right. Bharatanatyam is very dependent on rhythm and that time lag causes a huge challenge uh, in uh, what we are reciting as rhythm and what the student is receiving <coughs> and what we are then receiving back. And uh, that is very frustrating. With the dance company, uh, we have unfortunately not had an opportunity for them to come back into the dance studios to, uh, to practice because of all the uh, COVID um, pandemic restrictions. Mm -hmm. And so unfortunately our dance studios have, have had to remain closed, but we've had online classes uh, for the dancers in the company to remain uh, in uh, contact with their technique, with their classes. But what we did is we've had some incredible digital uh, initiatives uh, that have um, that have had a uh, um, really remarkable success. We had uh, our dancers interpret the poem of "A Caged Bird Sings" by Maya Angelou. Uh, we had dancecapes where we had four of our dancers dance in some beautiful locations around Mississauga, um, in in the parks and at the, at the lakefront of Mississauga. We had Dance Connects where we invited uh, many dancers from um, different parts of uh, um, you know, uh, uh, the world to send in their, uh, you know, their five to six minute dance performances that we would put on our Facebook. 
And most recently, we had a, a very exciting digital dance festival where we commissioned four amazing celebrity dancers from India in Kathak, Bharatanatyam, Mohiniyatam, and uh, Odissi to create new works during the pandemic as a marker of how even the most celebrated dancers who are continually on a, on a very busy schedule of performing and touring, how the pandemic has affected them. And these are dancers from India. Oh. And so we commissioned them to, to reflect on how the pandemic uh, affects even the greatest artists and what is that period of introspection for them. And so we just completed this wonderful festival in May called Anveshana Reflections in Solitude. And that we had over 400 people buy festival passes to see these great artists. Wow. And so uh, we've been busy. We've kept very busy with digital programming and initiatives. But, but I can't deny that even through the digital programming, it is booming it is really booming and it's, it's seeming like you know so vibrant and active even uh, even though the pandemic took its toll it, you can clearly see it's everything is still flourishing so that is awesome um, yes we uh, we've decided that we're not going to let the pandemic stop our creativity right. and um, and the momentum of what we keep doing absolutely it's, that's how it should be <laughs> How did you come to discover your passion for Bharatanatyam and at what age? At a very young age in India. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I would say I was about seven when I started my dance classes. And um, it's something that came to me very naturally. And it's, uh, it was uh, and stayed with me for the rest of my life. <laughs> that's that's actually quite amazing to be able to find your passion at a really young age. I think, you know, nowadays we discover it when we're much more older. And I think for for me, uh, that's how I would I felt like I feel like I discovered it older. But, you know, it's amazing to discover it at a young age. Um, who are your role models for Bharatanatyam and what aspects of their dance intrigued you or inspired you to incorporate them into your own art form? or understanding of the art form? Well, when I was dancing and I had started dancing, they were the greats. They were, you know, people like Kamla Lakshman, Vajanti Mala, uh, and um, Yamini Krishnamurti, um, and, and the many greats who were, you know, who, and, and Bharatanatyam at that time was, uh, because it was after the independence, uh, Bharatanatyam was being claimed as part of our national heritage. So it was it was at a time where all these artists were performing widely. And, and of course, it was also at the time that Bala Saraswati, who um, was from one of the traditional families uh, uh, of the uh, of the traditional heritage families, who was performing it. So there was so much a vibrancy around the reclamation of Bharatanatyam as a national heritage. So as a child, my parents made sure that I got to see all these great artists. So I certainly was inspired by, by many of them. That's brilliant. I wish I could travel back in time and <laughs> see all these amazing artists. You know, I can, I've only been exposed to uh, what I've seen on screen. But, right. But you know, to have an in-person experience with those kind of artists and or just at least see them on like a live stage, I think that would be a surreal experience. <laughs> yes, of course, yes. But then of course I went on and continued my training and uh, my inspiration has been both my gurus, you know, my my guru, Guru Kalyana Sundram Pillai and, and the late Guru Kalanidhi Narayanan uh, who taught me Abhinaya and I, did all my training with Guru Kalyana Sundram. I mean, they uh, they are virtual uh, icons of Bharatanatyam, and uh, it's it's been a privilege and a blessing to have learned from them because their uh, their knowledge, their expertise, 
and their passion for the art is something that I carry with me as, as truly a, a privilege. Yeah, it, that's, I think it would be such a huge privilege. <laughs> so I've heard that there are a few different styles of Bharatanatyam. Um, do you feel that it is strongly rooted in one style only to be directed in a particular manner of performance or is there fluidity in its expression, not specifically confined to one form? Well, the different styles um, are called Barnis in Bharatanatyam. Okay. And it's like in the Hindustani style of music, which is called Gharana. Okay. So in uh, Bharatanatyam, the different Barnis were named after the different villages from where the great masters came from. And they, uh, the Barnis are like, uh, they're called the Tanjavur Bani, the Mysur Bani, the Barravur Bani, the Pandanur Bani, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, my particular guru, uh, it's he came from the village of Tiruvadai Maradur from the Tanjavur district. So his style was called the Tanjavur style, but um, it went on to uh, being called the Raja Rajeshwari style because there were many other gurus from the Tanjavur district as well. And they also called their style the Tanjavur style. For many years, uh, these gurus insisted on the on a very particular aesthetic and technique of their styles. But um, as their students went on to become teachers, they adapted from other styles. And therefore, um, you know, one almost found that there was fluidity between the styles. Mm -hmm. and, um, and even dancers who learned from the same guru almost became very individualistic in their own styles. Uh, sometimes adapting from one to the other. Right. So I think today uh, one can say I learned from this particular style, but it's uh, it's not so rigid in being able to distinguish one from the other. Okay, I see. I think that's good. Uh, there, so then there is that uh, aspect of fluidity there. And like, even if you learn one style, you can see like each, um, individual or artist like incorporate different variations of that one so absolutely absolutely yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's that's good so um before settling into canada you had resided in indonesia were you able to generate exposure to classical dance there as well and are there any indonesian influences affiliated with your choreography well, actually, I lived in Canada for five years before I went to Indonesia. Right. So um, we were in uh, northern Manitoba okay. uh, in Thompson for five years in a mining um, community. Mm -hmm. And then my husband got transferred to Indonesia for 10 years uh, mm -hmm. with the same mining company. And, and yes, I mean, Indonesia has a very rich tradition of their own classical styles of dance from Bali, from Java. And even in Java, they have different styles, different classical forms. Mm -hmm. And I took a deep interest in, uh, in those forms and traveled actually quite frequently to Bali because I had a strong interest in Balinese dance. And I was lucky enough that where we were, uh, uh, where we were living in uh, Indonesia, there was a Balinese teacher and I took lessons from her. But people were also very keen to learn Indian dance and Bharatanatyam. So I had some students who also learned some students and some adult uh, ladies who were once Indonesian dancers and who had trained. So they were also very keen to learn from me. But uh, the, uh, the, um, my love for Balinese dance and my ability to speak Indonesian which I even speak today very fluently, oh, wow. um, has, has remained with me for all these years. So in 2016, I, um, I uh, met with a very, very prominent um, scholar of Balinese dance in Bali. And uh, we collaborated on, on, on a very unique work called Pralaya which was a collaboration in Bharatanatyam and Balinese dance. And uh, it remains today as one of the most uh, 
uh, admired and uh, celebrated pieces of productions of dance and Balinese dance um, because he is a scholar and we both worked extensively over three years developing the work. And we uh, it has eight dancers, four Balinese, four Bharatanatyam. And we met in Bali for oh, about a month, creating the work. And then we toured it across Canada in 2016 to about seven Canadian cities. And then we went back because there was demand for it in Indonesia and in India. So in 2019, we went back and we remounted the work, re-rehearsed it, and toured Indonesia and India with it. Wow, that that is a travel. It's a it's a travel filled with fusion. That's a lot. <laughs> well, it wasn't a fusion, actually. It is a work that was truly integrated. Mm -hmm. It came together in a in a very very um, uh, I would say authentic way of bringing the two forms together where um you know it wasn't just a cut and paste it was where the balinese dancers took extensive lessons in bharatanatyam mm -hmm. and the bharatanatyam dancers had to work very hard learning the technical aspects of ba balinese dance and we worked very hard at it. And the music was a, a really very interesting blend of uh, uh, Carnatic classical music and uh, Balinese, uh, their, their instruments and their singing. And um, it, it remains one of the most seminal works that uh, I've created for Sampradaya. That's beautiful. <laughs> um... So was the journey to establishing Sampradaya dance creations a difficult one? And what were the challenges you experienced along the way? Well, I established Sampradaya dance creations and the Academy 32 years ago. And uh, I would say it was challenging because um, it, it was not challenging because the Indian community was very supportive and uh, there was a lot of demand for um, for students to learn at the academy. Um, but one of the challenges is that many parents only wanted it to be a hobby. And nobody wanted to take it seriously as a lifelong pursuit and maybe take it to where they would want to consider it being a professional uh, pursuit. Mm -hmm. The other thing was that uh, the funding agencies really never perceived uh, Bharatanatyam as a, a, a really strong classical form, like ballet, for instance, whereas Bharatanatyam is as rigorous, sophisticated, and highly developed like ballet. It needs the same amount or years of rigorous training to, to get to be a, you know, a, a well-developed dancer. So it took many years to convince them that Bharatanatyam was not a folk dance, but it was a sophisticated and rich vocabulary of technique, of theory, of rhythm, of music, uh, and, and therefore deserving of grants from the various uh, granting agencies. And so today, that, that, was, uh, that was a lot of effort to demystify Indian dance. And I think today that effort has uh, borne fruit because Sampradaya is at a point where it's receiving federal funding, provincial and municipal funding. And we are now able to uh, encourage emerging artists and help develop their uh, careers to become professional dancers. That's brilliant. I always used to think that even with the large amount of exposure that Paranatyam has now, at least compared to several, several years before, there is still a um, obstruction sometimes to get it to the maximum amount of exposure that it needs. But to know that it is reaching this level and it is reaching the level of getting uh, grants and um, it's seen in the eye of uh, the Canadian community, that's just an amazing thing. <laughs> but it's still, there's still a very big challenge. And that challenge is 
that the mainstream theaters uh, and presenters do not present it uh, on their seasons or in their programming. Uh, we still are having to self-present or being presented by the community, the Indian community organizations. And even when we produce productions like the Indo-Balinese and the many other really sophisticated productions, uh, we're ending up having to self-produce. Uh, we're still not at the point where the many um, presenters, mainstream presenters, are presenting Indian dance. Uh, even the most well-produced work. Mm -hmm. So that is still a challenge and we have to fight that. Right, right. It's a struggle, but you know, you gotta keep pushing so it reaches its top most potential. <laughs> so right. you have received uh, numerous awards and accolades, uh, such as being the member in the Order of Canada, the Pravasi Bharatiya Saman Award, Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal, and title as the first performing artist in Canada. And you, you've also been recently appointed as the adjunct professor at the universe at York University in Toronto. So out of all these awards, these are enormous achievements, by the way, um, which would which would you say, like which accolade or award would you say you're most proud of? Well, every one of them is is truly such a privilege. And, uh, and, you know, truly, I, I, I feel very uh, blessed. But I, I think um, the Order of Canada because it's, I was the first South Asian artist to receive the Order of Canada oh. thus far. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so that that is special. Yeah. And also the um, Pravasi Bhartiya Saman because it was given to a diaspora um, artist from Canada. Oh, okay. So, and they came one year after the other. You know, in 2009 was Order of Canada and 2010 was Pravasi Bharatiya Samman. So, uh, you know, those are special because they were both national awards uh, from India and Canada and one year apart. And uh, so, I mean, but every every award makes, to, it's truly really humbling. And I, I also want to say that I acknowledge the rest of my team, you know, in Sampradaya, because all these are, uh, yes, they're personal awards, but they're also because of all the support and the great work that, you know, I get from my general manager, Jasmine Savant, and my assistant artistic director, Suma Nair, and the rest of my team, my dancers, my board, all of them give me such amazing okay. support. Yeah, wow. so. Absolutely. That's, a, that's excellent. That's excellent. You know, your school supporting you and your academy along with everything. It's brilliant. So I've learned that apart from Bharatanatyam, um, cross-cultural collaborations had also played a role in shaping your choreography, which you had brief, you know, briefly touched upon a while back. Um, how did this come about? And are there any contemporary styles in particular you integrate into your dance creations? I remember you talking about Bali, but uh, the Bali styles, other than that. Well, I think we are very lucky to be living in Canada because we, it truly is the meeting point of so many cultures and particularly in a city like Toronto. But uh, when I did my master's at York, I, I came across so many wonderful artists who, you know, were, you know, from Afro-Caribbean backgrounds, uh, who were from, you know, Chinese uh, dance backgrounds, who were from Korean backgrounds, flamenco backgrounds. I think from each of them, I learned so much about their traditions, about their performance movement styles. And I also got, and I get to watch also so much happening in Toronto. There's no doubt that they all influence me. They influence the way I see my own dance, my own choreography. And um, so even though I don't really use modern dance technique mm -hmm. in, um, in my productions, um, my dancers have also uh, trained in uh, the Kerala um, art form of Kalari, 
uh, martial art form of kalari paitu they also take training in that so in in some productions they color um, movements of kalari have been incorporated mm -hmm. uh, my dancers also trained in chao uh, mm -hmm. which is a martial art form from the east of india from um, odisha so we've done a production based on chao you know not necessarily all chao mm -hmm. so you know we've worked within the asian aesthetic you know kalari mm -hmm. and chao but um, when we do works that uh, are uh, uh, you know contemporaryized bharatanatyam uh, we do aspects of i mean we do use aspects of contemporary uh, choreographic um, sort of um, aspects you know how mm -hmm. how we would move um, the bharatanatyam structures right. on the stage you know right. as opposed to the traditional formations and things like that okay. uh, we do consider different lighting patterns we do consider different stage design visual design all those sorts of things or maybe costume design oh. uh, so those are the kinds of things but i not necessarily using modern dance movements or anything okay got you i understand <laughs> so traveling and touring is such an exciting and effective way to create awareness and increase exposure to many different and diverse communities about ethnic art forms uh, which location have you toured has given you the most memorable experience in facilitating awareness about your dance creations i think everywhere that i've traveled i mean you know it's uh, uh traveling is actually and keeping your mind open to new influences and to new um uh you know and reading reading is so much a part of what i do because new poetry new literature it just opens up your mind about new ways of seeing what you do so there's no particular location in the world no it's i mean indonesia is the most favorite country that i would travel to any time but you know traveling to to turkey and you know watching watching the uh, the whirling dervishes i mean just oh, just wow. okay just watching the uh, the philosophy mm -hmm. of uh, of rumi you know and watching the uh, understanding the uh, the intent of 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 the uh, the dance and the whole sublimation of oneself that that also then becomes part of your uh you the search when you're doing your choreography you know um it, it, there's no not one part of the world that doesn't uh, influence mm -hmm. you know your your thinking as a creator of new work absolutely that's that's amazing so everything is it's all there <laughs> it's all there but you don't have to travel you just have to read you just have to be curious about life you have to watch a lot of dance right. and 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 be uh, be eager eager to learn right that that definitely needs to be there otherwise nothing is going to happen. <laughs> yeah. What projects uh, can we look forward to in the future from Sampradaya Dance Creations and are there any collaborations you look forward to as well? Well, we've got quite a few things in the pipeline, but uh we're also remounting some of our old productions and looking at them with a fresh eye and re uh, you know, re uh choreographing them because they were done by a, a set of older dancers now we want to reset them on some of the the current dancers that we have and see whether we can bring some freshness into the new work mm -hmm. and uh uh yeah there are some but i mean it's so much depends on the pandemic you know everything has been pushed back by 2 years 3 years that we're so afraid to plan and uh i mean now we're all hoping for things to open up this summer but then with uh, 
with the disheartening news that a new variant is already ready yeah. to arrive at our doorstep, mm -hmm. it's uh, everything is is sort of being held on the back burner right now. And yeah. yeah. It is, it's not looking too bright and sunny, but at least it is progressing, uh, yes. the conditions. Yes, yes. Definitely looking forward to everything that Sampradaya has to offer for sure. Thank you, thank you. Well, we are looking forward to it. And uh, it's, um, you know, the worry also is, is it going to be digital or are we going to have an audience for it? Is it going to be outdoor? We have a beautiful 100-seat theater in our facility with all the wonderful uh, state-of-the-art lighting and sound and projection. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful place for performances. So um, we, we'd be happy if we can even use our theater for all our productions. Right. But even that, we've got to get permission to be able to hold it there. So, yeah, you know, cross our fingers, hope for the best. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Miss Leda, for being here with us today. We had such an amazing chat, such an enlightening and fascinating chat. Thank um, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good to talk to you, Uttara. Thank, Thank you very much. I'm signing off today with on chats with Sara. I will see everybody, hopefully, uh, next week on Limelight.